Welcome everyone to the next episode of our Plant Room series and I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to an incredible campaigner, entrepreneur, female entrepreneur, Sean Sutherland, founder and CEO of A Plastic Planet. It's such a pleasure to be with you and I've just noticed this light. I truly do have a sunlight spotlight on me today. <laughs> so how can we ignite business from within to help them change? How can we work with governments to put pressure on industry so that there is you know, a universal mandate for change, but then help industry with solutions so that they can change faster? Because ultimately it's about choice and in my opinion, this is not about an ethical consumer that we magically expect to mushroom across the globe to drive the change forward. Plastic is not really a waste problem, a pollution problem. It's a production problem. It's a design problem. So where we need to look is at the beginning of the process, which is where we conceive of everything, where we design, where we create everything, we produce everything, rather than looking at the end of the pipe, which is the waste. So that's what we do at A Plastic Planet. And our first campaign um, was thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if you could push that trolley through your supermarket and you had the choice because there was an aisle that was free of plastic. So we created this, this thing. We you know, were asking all supermarkets to give us the plastic free aisle. So coming back to the fundamental issue, is it possible to currently live guilt free and plastic free? In my opinion, it's incredibly difficult. And I applaud those wonderful zero wasters who have their, their annual waste in a jam jar. <laughs> and even the jam jar, they're gonna reuse it next year. It, uh, it's extraordinary because that is a massively inconvenient, um, countercultural lifestyle. Yeah. But I, and I love those outliers. But to be honest, a few zero wasters, that's not gonna move the dial. You know, we have to make it much more possible. Yeah. Plastic is everywhere. Not only is it everywhere in a polluted sense, it's in the air that we're breathing today. It's in my cup of tea here. It's in every glass of water that we drink, glass of wine, beer, whatever. It's in the deep impacted ice of Antarctica. It is six miles deep in the Mariana Trench. So we have infected our planet with plastic. There is more plastic in soil than there is even in the oceans. And obviously the oceans has had a massive amount of attention and rightly so what we've done to the oceans is indefensible, but we're also doing it to, to our soil where we grow our food. So this plastic is everywhere. And yet we continue to pump it out at this accelerating pace. It is in the paint on our walls. It's, it's the carpet that we walk on. It is literally, it's 70% of all the clothing that we wear. You know, so it's almost impossible, even if you think, okay, I can eliminate plastic packaging out of my life, then how you eliminate plastic in totality is incredibly difficult. And why, um, why has it got to that extent? You know, can you tell our audience a little bit about why plastic has proliferated because it obviously has benefits for it to be in such high use, um, but these benefits haven't been truly costed out from, a, from an economic point of view. It's that externality, that negative externality hasn't quite been costed out, has it? No, totally true. So we have a very fake price of plastic. Number one, it comes from the most subsidized industry in the world, the fossil fuel industry. So it is uh, de facto the most subsidized material on the planet. It is eye-wateringly cheap. So whenever you're looking at a, I replace this with this, it's always incredibly difficult to compete on price with plastic. And the second reason is that it's almost limitless. So it isn't, isn't like many of the biomaterials that we see where there is a limited resource. If you look at something like um, the fact that fast fashion could not exist without fossil fuels. If you look at the amount of wool that we use over the last 20 years, it's pretty static. If you look at the amount of cotton, it's pretty static. The amount of polyester and fossil fuel based uh, yarn textiles, 70% now of every textile that we make is made out Exponential of fossil fuels. Exponential growth. Exponential growth. So that has been the enabler of so much. And, and I always think you know, that for me, plastic is the gateway to everything. It is, if, you, if we crack plastic, we will crack so many things that we are doing wrong because it is the one material invention that enabled us to make things so easy, so cheaply, so lightweight. The, pla the, the plastic is actually quite fantastic in, a, in, a, in an yeah. odd sort of way. But it means that 
that we could make, we could use things once and throw them away. Yeah. And this is, we, we feel that this has always been thus. It has not always been this way. You know, there was never the amount of waste. We're now producing something like 6 billion tons of waste every single year. That's what we give back to the planet. Waste, we're the only species that create any waste at all. So what does yeah. this actually mean for, for individuals? Do you know, do you have any information about how much waste we create on average in certain areas of the world, number mm -hmm. one? And then the second question is, there are best practice leaders. So the first thing, obviously that six billion tons, doesn't it just include plastic? That's waste that we create generally. Right. But the vast percentage of that is going to be plastic because it's the thing that doesn't have any real value system in a recycling system. Whereas paper, pulp, glass, metal, those things, there is a well-established recycling system. So there is a there's a value in keeping them into that into our resource structure. Monetary value, yeah. Yeah, which there really isn't with plastic. Uh, whatever we we try and fool ourselves that they're recycling fairies, they really don't exist. So to, to give it some kind of perspective, per capita, the, the biggest producer of plastic waste in the world, so per head, is the US. And I'm, sh I'm ashamed and shocked to tell you that number two in this sorry league is the UK. So wow. we produce more waste per person in the US than any other country in the world other than the Americans. Wow. Yeah. Um, we are, you know, the US are the biggest exporters of plastic waste. Um, but the but Europe is number two for the export of plastic waste. And the UK, we send abroad, often to some of the poorest people on the planet, 60% of our plastic waste. So when you think that you're doing the right thing, at UK or wherever you are, and you rinse out your yogurt pot and you put it in the right recycling bin at home and you see the truck pick it up, and then what? Where is it going? Where does and it I, go? And it used to be almost the, that was the extent of our personal responsibility, was thinking, well, all I can do is put it in the right bin. But now we know how broken the plastic recycling system is. Or do, and, I'd, love, I'd love for you to actually tell people, because this is what... You know, I was alarmed at the recycling rates. Globally, it is less than 10%. And the UK are bang on that average. We are 9% in the UK because we're exporting such a vast amount of it. I and just often, put well on that number, actually. 9%. 9%. Yes. Less 9%. than 10%. It's, it's, it's staggeringly low, isn't it? Staggeringly low. And we have been fed this misinformation. Do you know, only a couple of years ago, if you exported plastic, that was considered recycling. You have no idea what it's being burnt on the, on the roadsides in Turkish villages, but you could still consider that recycling. So for many years, the UK would say to the rest of Europe, we're ahead on our recycling targets because we were simply shipping it abroad. So the biggest thing that China has given the planet, there are many, but one of the biggest things is their national sword campaign, where four years ago they said, that's it, we will no longer import 90% of the world's plastic rubbish, which is what was happening. Everything ended up back in China. And so they they created this, this wall. They said it's now going to be clean, green China. Um, and in, in the way that only um, you know, civilizations like China can, where they said that's it, and it happens on the first of January, and boom, that the world could no longer send their waste to China. Suddenly, you know, like some kind of seeping oily liquid, we're trying to find where else we can put it, yeah. and that's why we've been sending it to all these other countries. So the the recycling system globally is a complete greenwash of of mist and lies, to be honest which has been put out for decades by the fossil fuel industry so that they can continue to pump it out as virgin plastic at the beginning, saying, we just need to improve recycling. This material is recyclable. And that word recyclable is one of the weasel words that I believe should be banned in the world of plastic. Because what it means is the Coca-Colas of the world, and sorry to cite one brand, but they are far and away the biggest polluter on the planet. And the most loved brand, go figure, that's the madness of, of man. Um, but Coca-Cola think it's completely okay to continue using a plastic bottle because they say it's 100% recyclable. And it isn't our problem if you, the consumer, don't put it in the right bin or the infrastructure isn't there to recycle it. And I feel that that, that is where 
uh, new laws on responsibility are going to have dramatic effects. If you decide to use a toxic indestructible material as a producer, you have to be responsible for its second, third, fourth, fifth, forever life. And if we change the laws that that happens, we will change everything. So I want to actually demystify some of these terms because it's really complicated. Um, at uh, Bags of Ethics and Supreme Creations, we are constantly faced by customers, single customers, consumers, as well as B2B clients, our industry cup clients across retail, fashion, lifestyle, beauty, um, uh, packaging requirements, and terminology is completely mm. used. So I'm going to do a quick fire buzz um, or with you on some terms, if that's all right. So the first is, can you tell us what is the difference between recyclable, whatever that means, as you just said, and recycled. So technically, if a material can be recycled into something, then you would call it recyclable. If it's recycled, it means it actually has to have been converted in a recycling factory from one thing to another. But be aware, it doesn't mean that 100% of it is recycled. It could have a very small percentage and still say contains recycled. Uh, so recyclable is the word that we need to avoid. It means nothing if there is no infrastructure to actually recycle it. Recycled is a better word. But what you have to consider is an aluminium can, for example, one can becomes another can. It doesn't degrade in the process. Plastic degrades every time it's recycled. People will talk to you about chemical recycling and chemical recycling is now being touted as this is the big holy grail for plastic. Incredibly toxic, incredibly energy into intensive process to bring it back to its, its uh, original form as a fossil fuel to then make more plastic. So we're not actually ever innovating our way into a different material. We're just sticking with the status quo that we know has been so harmful to the planet because it's based on fossil fuels. There are lots of brands saying that this item has been made from three plastic bottles or this item has been made from five uh, 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 plastic bottles or whatever it is. Can you describe a what are the fundamentals of that claim? And B, um, how difficult that might be and what are the impacts on the supply chain? So one thing we have to be very aware of is, is green initiatives that are actually simply marketing. So you've just named a perfect example of that, which is let's say you're gonna go and buy a polyester fleece and they say, we've made this, this fleece from uh, water bottles, from waste water bottles. And all you've done there is you've given it one extra little bit of life. But every time you wash that garment, every time you wear that garment, it will be shedding polyester microfibers and nanofibers. So you, you are not stopping the problem. You're delaying it from you know, one step uh, next is going to be the bin, the incinerator, the export truck to Turkey or the environment in some way. So that whole thing of taking plastic and using it in some kind of green marketing way I hate to say, but the Adidas Ocean plastic shoe, perfect example of that. Why are we honoring a plastic that should never ever exist? Whilst on the quiet, pumping out another many million virgin white trainers made out of plastic. So just to get, so, let's just, just dig deeper into that. Is it good? It's definitely better to try and do something with it. Right. But I think think as mankind yet, I don't think we've cracked. What is a healthy way to take the waste that we are responsible for, the millions of tons that, that are out there, to take that and make something that is not going to damage the environment or human health. Because the other problem with plastic is not just how uh, pervasive it is in our environment, how, you know, how, how much of the planet we've infected with plastic, large and small. It's also the toxins that we add to plastic. And this right. is one of the issues, because these are the chemicals that are known to be endocrine disruptors, to have impact on cognitive disorders, immune disorders, fertility, heart disease, cancer. You know, these are chemicals on the European register, chemicals of extreme concern. So we have to be very careful that we're not simply enabling the system by focusing on what's the small amount of plastic waste that we can perhaps take and do something useful with, when what we're not doing is turning off the tap. So, and right now, no. yeah, so, right no, now, we're going to treble plastic by 2040. Right. So we're still focusing on the waste, 
And we're not nearly focused enough on, hang on a minute, where's the legislation? Where's the responsibility for the polymer manufacturers, AKA big oil, to turn off the tap? So can we tackle the sort of upcycling and what do we do with the waste? Because as you say, there is, there is we should try and at least use this material in some form if possible, or yes. not? Yeah, well, I, I think let's step back and think, if we had a, a white piece of paper and we invented this incredible material that was so flexible, so adaptable, that lasted for hundreds of years, then how should we treat it? What would, should we use it for? Should we use it for packaging? Would it, which is, you know, this, this ephemeral temporary thing for us to transport something home most of the time and then hits the bin. Should we use it for single use items like straws and drinks cups and all of those things, you know, plastic sachets, all of that. Should we use it for that? Or should we keep it for things where it can perhaps be kept in a more circular system where we need a material to give us all the qualities, the extraordinary qualities that, that plastic can, can deliver for us, but we need it to last for centuries. So if we could rethink that, and obviously clothing is not one of those, packaging is not one of those. So I would love to see some other initiatives which are saying, let's take some of this plastic waste. And we're obviously talking about the usable stuff. We're not talking about the, the millions of tons in the oceans and the soils that are, are not even visible to the human eye. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, nature is going to have to fix that because it's impossible for us to clean the oceans. So that, that's down to nature. But how can we just take the big bits and use plastic for something that makes sense? And that would be a really interesting challenge for mankind, wouldn't it? To think, I love what, do we need? what do we need that needs to last for 500 years? Yeah. Because that's what we should use plastic for. And then how should we price it? Because when we invented plastic, because it's a byproduct from the fossil fuel industry and therefore you know, heavily subsidized and everything that we've covered, it is unbelievably cheap. And in fact, it should be unbelievably expensive yeah. because you have to manage it and control it and respect it. So we invent this material and instead of putting it on a pedestal and treating it like gold and pricing it accordingly, we literally treat it like rubbish. What top tips do you have as for, for budding entrepreneurs who want to create something long lasting and reusable? And then the second question around consumers, you know, how, how can we create change? How can we start applying pressure um, whilst also just going about our everyday lives and not feeling the guilt of all of this plastic? Yes. <laughs> now we know what we know, we're never gonna unknow it. But don't feel the guilt, apply the pressure. Of course, never have another plastic bag. You know, always have a bag of bags of ethics, always, you know, follow the people that are doing the right thing um, and really champion the newer brands, because you will see now that the newer brands innately are creating things in a very different way. Yeah. So try not to have a disposable coffee cup every time you have a cup of coffee, all those simple things. Yes. Um, but more than that, for me, your real power is, yes, vote with your wallet, but vote at work. Vote with what you do every single day, because that is where your real power is. I think, you know, as consumers, we have limited power in this. But as, you know, within industry, which is consumers at work, yeah. that's where our power is. And then, of course, we should, at every opportunity, lobby governments to pressure industry to sell us something different. So I would really uh, urge everybody to look, if you are a budding entrepreneur, think radically. Think about that white sheet of paper. And in fact, I had a conversation with Unilever yesterday, now the third biggest polluter on the planet, yeah. massively ambitious plastic reduction uh, goals by 2025. The only global industry who has actually said we have an absolute reduction versus we're just going to use more recyclable materials. So I applaud them for setting these really lofty ambitions. But when, we, when I was talking to them about you know, what they're trying to do, you know how hard it is and how much easier it would be if legislation were happening. So all of these things have to, have to fall into place. But I also know there is something incredibly powerful about plastic. We feel as individuals so guilty about it. If your place of work can be encouraged to do something different, as I see in, in someone like Unilever, then the, uh, the team spirit that is created around that, the pride that you work for an organization that is walking the walk, not just doing yet another ESG pact or pledge. I think these are the things that make such a huge difference. And for any entrepreneur, 
you have to be looking at system change as well as material change. The future will be refill. What can we do as individuals, which is still affordable because some of the issues around um, being more sustainable do center around, oh, well, it's only for the privileged. The privileged few. The privileged I so agree. Few. So, I mean, as a brand, we really want to democratize and make it very accessible for people, uh, your everyday person anywhere in the world, the developing countries or less economically developed countries actually have far more sustainable practices and less disposable practices on one level because they, you know, they, they hold on to things and reuse them to death. Uh, yes. They can't afford to buy lots of disposable items. But how can we, um, as, as individuals, who might not have lots of money do this. Yeah, it's so it's such a great point because we have to democratize sustainability. And I look at things like the organic movement and think, how was it ever okay for it to be priced at such a level that it was, we were actually just saying, let the poor people eat the pesticides and the rich people can afford to have clean food. We can never allow that to happen in the plastic crisis, in the climate crisis. So we have to, um, that, that's why I think systemic change is going to be yes. the answer. Right now, you go to a supermarket and you buy something that is pre-packaged in plastic and you buy the amount that you are sold. Wait, we're not buying the bottle. I'm buying the stuff inside the bottle or the bag or the box. We love the unboxing experience. That's I find it amazing. You know, yesterday, Today, packaging equals luxury. Yes. Today, packaging equals waste. The future is refillable. The future is all about reusable, for sure. And this is a mantra that we would say all day, every day. But where does the personality come from? But then that for me is that's the personality that you inject at home because that is my beautiful little permanent piece of packaging. And it could be a lovely ceramic thing with a metal pump, it could be whatever, that I then decant things into. And it, so you don't have to suddenly just, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but, but just make your life so sterile yeah. that, <laughs> you know, because I, I don't believe that, that living in harmony with nature being environmental it's not it's not about scratchy shirts and knitted armpits and hairy sandals yeah, that yeah. that's not aspirational for me you know I, I I love clothes I love fashion I you know all of that and having an, your own individual style is very important but there has to be better smarter ways of us doing it you know plastic can be found anywhere um and predominantly in fruit and vegetable packaging what can people do to to avoid that some simple steps so, so use local markets try and buy loose wherever you can get some of those little birchwood nets and just have those with you always carry a bag with you banish cling film from your life it's in, it's very unhealthy uh, plastic and food should never go together so you know what i know about human health and plastic definitely don't cook in plastic don't freeze in plastic whatever you can do just keep the two as separate as you can and um, is it glass is it stainless steel Exactly, all of those things. And often, do you really need anything at all? You know, the whole thing with cling film, and I remember my husband, you know, he's, a, he's an amazing chef. So I'm like, whoa, what am I going to use instead? <laughs> well, how, how do I separate things in the fridge? And I was like, I don't know, put a plate on top of it. It's just hilarious. You just go back to things that you remember your mum doing. Yes. And then the other area is, of course, the invisibility of plastic within textiles. So just be aware of that and, you know, buy, buy less, buy better try and buy natural fibres, wear natural fibres wherever you can. If someone wants to connect with you, Sean, what's the best way? And are there any um, actions that you're, any campaigns that you're running that you'd love our audience to take action on? So, well, there's a couple of things actually. And one is plastic free fashion. So if anybody is listening to this is in the world of fashion and would, would like to get involved in helping us create a movement working with the fashion industry, not against it, to really um, accelerate the switch from fossil fuel fibers into natural fibers. That would be amazing. Uh, you can find me uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sean Sutherland. I'm very easy to find. We are all in this together. And I just want to say thank you so much for being so uh, educational in your, in your conversation with me and also giving us hope that actually it is about rethinking and it's not always the fault and it's certainly not always the fault of the consumer. Really, we have to start at the top of the pyramid of rethinking things, pushing for legislation, 
making mm. industry change in a collaborative way, and then the consumer can live guilt-free because they're making a choice um, which is far more fair on them. Totally agree. And congratulations on everything you're doing because you are leading the charge. We need more businesses like yours. Well, thank you so much. And it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be speaking with you. Thank you.